Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Robert. And I'm Yochanan El Rom. In our top story, Israel has vehemently rejected Hamas's terms of surrender and has doubled down on its commitment to completely eradicate the Iranian-backed terror group and demilitarize the Gaza Strip. Hamas recently demanded the release of all its terrorists imprisoned in Israel, the full withdrawal of IDF forces from the coastal enclave, and international assurances that the terror group will remain in control of the Gaza Strip. Hamas claimed that it would release the remaining 136 hostages after its list of demands was met. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected the offer, saying, We are continuing the war on all fronts in all sectors. We are not giving immunity to any terrorist, not in Gaza, not in Lebanon, not in Syria, not anywhere. The Israeli army has fought bravely to liberate the Hamas stronghold of Khan Yunus in southern Gaza. The IDF has met heavy resistance from Islamic terrorists who are protecting the remaining Hamas leadership cowering in the tunnels underneath the city. Dozens of soldiers have been killed by Palestinian extremists firing rocket-propelled grenades. One such attack on two buildings where the terror group stored explosive mines caused the structures to collapse on Israeli soldiers. Terrorists also fired an RPG at an IDF tank. The fight for Khan Yunus is especially difficult due to the high number of civilians who either refuse to leave the area or are being forced to act as human shields for Hamas leaders. Several hospitals in the city also serve as terrorist hideouts, and the IDF is operating cautiously to avoid civilian casualties. The IDF has discovered that the tunnel systems constructed by the Hamas terror group under Gaza are much larger than it previously estimated. The Iranian-backed terror group has built more than 5,700 shafts, leading to a vast underground network of tunnels that stretch between 350 to 450 miles underneath the Gaza Strip. The IDF noted that Hamas used 6,000 tons of concrete, 18,000 tons of steel, and spent hundreds of millions of dollars to construct the terror passages while the people of Gaza lived in poverty. More than 132 hostages remain in the captivity of senior Hamas leaders inside of the tunnels. The IDF is operating with the knowledge that many of the shafts have been booby-trapped and rigged with explosives. It said that the total destruction of the network of tunnels will take at least a year. Iran is ordering Houthi rebels in Yemen to attack ships in the Red Sea. Intelligence officials have disclosed that the fanatic Islamic Republic has increased weapon shipments to its proxy army in Yemen and that commanders from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps are on the ground training and directing attacks on ships in the strategic international shipping lanes. Intelligence agencies said Tehran has provided sophisticated weapons to the rebels, including advanced drones, anti-ship cruise missiles, precision strike ballistic missiles, and medium-range missiles. These weapons pose a grave threat not only to commercial vessels and their crews, but also to U.S. and Allied forces in the region. Two U.S. Navy SEALs died in operations against an Iranian ship transporting weapons to the Houthis. Palestinian Authority has added thousands of terrorists to its pay-to-slay murder incentive program since the October 7th attack on Israel when terrorists infiltrated the Jewish state and slaughtered 1,200 people and took 240 others hostage. Palestinian Media Watch, an Arabic-language watchdog organization, has reported that the PA has added an additional 3,550 imprisoned terrorists to its monthly payroll since October 7th. 661 of them are known Hamas members. Shortly after October 7th, the PA pledged $3 million to the families of Hamas terrorists killed in Israel on that fateful day. Its continued participation and incitement to violence through the Pay to Slay program serves as evidence of the PA's inability to live alongside Israel in peace. Tech mogul Elon Musk and political commentator Ben Shapiro visited the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp in Poland ahead of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. The pair were given a private tour of the death camp by Holocaust survivor Gidon Lev and Rabbi Menachem Margolin. The group laid wreaths at the wall of death, lit candles, and participated in a silent memorial. 
Musk is a billionaire entrepreneur and owner of the X platform. He's an advocate for free speech, which has led some critics to accuse him of allowing the proliferation of online anti-Semitism. Ben Shapiro has publicly refuted these accusations on his conservative Daily Wire program. Musk recently visited the Jewish state and the site of the Hamas massacres, where he expressed his horror at the devastation. Afterwards, he stressed the immediate need to stop the indoctrination of children in Gaza to hatred and violence against Jews. The Israel Defense Forces has unveiled its newest armored vehicle, which it designed to evacuate injured soldiers and civilians from active combat zones. The Beri, named for one of the Israeli kibbutzim hardest hit by the October 7th Hamas attacks on Israel, is unlike any other vehicle in the IDF's fleet. It weighs five tons and can travel up to 80 miles an hour. It was designed to withstand almost any off-road surface and provides maximum protection to the occupants inside. Barry's tires can inflate and deflate with the push of a button, allowing it to navigate difficult terrain. It also has several operating modes, allowing it to adapt quickly under fire and is equipped with a removable windshield, permitting swift evacuation. The director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency said his organization is being held hostage by Iran. Rafael Grossi explained that Iran is limiting cooperation with the IAEA in an unprecedented way. The radical Shiite regime is rejecting inspectors employed by the nuclear watchdog agency based on their nationality. Grossi complained, it is as if they are taking the IAEA hostage due to their political disputes with others. Grossi stressed the rogue Islamic Republic is advancing its nuclear program at an alarming rate and its uranium enrichment is nearing weapons-grade levels. According to the atomic expert, Tehran has already amassed enough fissile material for several nuclear warheads. Israeli archaeologists excavating in the Judean hills just outside of Jerusalem have discovered an extremely rare ancient silver coin. Experts with the Israel Antiquities Authority hailed the find as being one of the oldest silver weights ever found in Israel. Making it even more special is evidence that it was minted abroad and brought to the land of Israel during the Persian period as early as the 5th century BCE. Archaeologists explain that the coin, which weighs 11.07 grams, was a standard weight in the kingdom of Judah, demonstrating that commodities were carefully weighed in the markets. The coin was found at a site situated in the rural area of the kingdom of Judah, whose capital was in Jerusalem. The region was settled during the first temple period 2,700 years ago during the reigns of the kings of Judah, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Amnon and Josiah. A cutting-edge Israeli medical technology has helped to drastically reduce the death rate of war wounded during the ongoing military operation in Gaza known as Iron Swords. According to the Times of Israel, the mortality rate of the wounded in the war with Hamas is less than half that during the Second Lebanon War and 2.5 percent less than Operation Protective Edge in the summer of 2014. One of the advancements implemented in the treatment of patients from the October 7th Hamas massacre in Israel and the ensuing war in Gaza has been the use of an artificial intelligence platform called ADOC. This program analyzes patient scans and sends important alerts to doctors and staff so they can immediately begin streamlining a treatment plan and necessary intervention. The Knesset Christian Allies Caucus commemorated 20 years of faith-based diplomacy in a ceremony in Israel's parliament last week. The event was co-hosted by KCAC co-chairs, member of Knesset Yuli Edelstein and MK Sharin Haskell. It focused on two decades of cooperation and coordination between Israeli leaders, their Christian counterparts, and leaders from around the world. Josh Reinstein, the director of the Knesset Christian Allies Caucus, said, Since the KCAC's inception in 2004, we have seen that it is Christians, not countries, that stand with Israel. He said, Our anniversary event highlights the incredible political, diplomatic, and financial support for Israel from Bible-believing Christians and the power of faith-based diplomacy, particularly during wartime. 
Jews around the world marked the holiday of Tu B'Shvat last week. This festival is observed on the 15th day of the Hebrew month of Shvat, and it celebrates the New Year for Trees. The Bible prohibits Jews from eating fruit from trees that are less than three years old. Therefore, the rabbis created a date to calculate the beginning of the agricultural cycle. This also applies to biblical tithes, including the offering of first fruits, or bikurim, and the compulsory produce donation to the Levites, the widows, and the poor. Tu B'Shvat has become known as the Israeli Arbor Day, as it is marked by planting trees. Now, this year, many Jews have chosen to replant the fields of border communities that were devastated and burned by Hamas terrorists on October 7th. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned now for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Dr. Martin Sherman. He's the head of the Israeli Institute for Strategic Studies. Dr. Sherman, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so, for having me. You know, it's been uh, three months, a little bit over, uh, since the October 7th attack, and uh, I've known you for, for a few decades now. You've been warning about this. You've been talking about this. You said this is going to happen. Why did it, no one see it coming? Well, I think it was uh, wishful thinking, and people were in the iron grip of political correctness. Uh, you know, you had to assume that uh, the Palestinians were just like us, and once they uh, achieved independence, they would pursue the same things that we pursue. But of course, uh, that is the great failing in many ways of liberal philosophy. Because what does the liberal say to you? He says, you, you know, you must recognize the, the, the pluralism of humanity. And they're right, you know, the diversity of humanity. And you're right, humanity is diverse. But then they say something, that actually empties that statement of any meaning because they say, but you should treat everyone equally. So, you know, what's the point of acknowledging diversity if you have to treat everyone equally? You know, you, know, you might have a mild-mannered pastor with horn-rimmed glasses and leather patches on his, on, his, on, his, on his jacket preaching love and humanity, and then you could have a wild-eyed uh, atullah uh, pre preaching death to the infidel. How are you going to treat these people equally? And uh, I think... Uh, our neighbors tend more to the wild-eyed Ayatollah than to the peaceful pastor. And uh, we've just uh, haven't uh, tailored our uh, policies in accordance with that. You know, everyone's talking about the day after in Gaza. Uh, we're still in the midst of the fight. But uh, you've been very critical of some of the suggestions that came out of it. What do you think should Gaza should look like the day after? Put it this way. If there's any chance of reconstructing the south of the country... That will not happen if there are Arabs left in Gaza. Because the cruel dilemma is there will either be Jews in the Negev or Arabs in Gaza, but in the long run there won't be both. And so I think now I understand there are a few uh, uh, initiatives going on, by the way, one adopted by Nikki Haley as well, to remove the Gazan population from the Gaza Strip and have them being rehabilitated and relocated into third-party countries. Uh, at the moment, the big obstacle to this is Egypt, which really makes you wonder, you know, do the Egyptians care so much about the, the Gazan population that they'd rather have them wallow in squalor and, and destruction and dilapidation rather than let them move into Sinai where they could be moved to other countries. Well, this brings up another question. You know, we saw in the Syrian civil war millions of Syrians going to other countries around the world. I think Germany took a million Syrians just themselves. Why won't anyone accept refugees from Gaza? Good question. And the refusal certainly uh, has a, 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 a scent of uh, anti-Semitism. Because if Ukrainians can find refugee, refuge, and if Armenians can find refuge, and if you point out Syrians can find refuge, why shouldn't Palestinians? You know, the, what they're trying to say is, is force us down our throat. You deal with it. Why should we? With it? And, and the, you know, the Palestinian issue, uh, uh, in terms of its scale and scope, is, is the easiest, the easiest uh, uh, problem to solve. Because 
if you if you if you're talking about uh, Gaza, they they're two million. Egypt could take a million. That's one percent of the Egyptian population, and Syria could take an, another uh, uh, five hundred thousand, uh, which is also about one percent of their population. It's 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 really a, a, an insignificant, negligent problem if there is political goodwill and political resolve. Well, let's talk about Judea and Samaria because you speak about that often. Uh, your your big uh, theory was that Judea and Samaria is a ticking time bomb, uh, much like we saw in in Gaza. Do you still see that as of the course. case? Of course, of course. And you know the the big difference between between Gaza and Judea and Samaria is that Gaza has a uh, a border of about fifty kilometers, which abuts. A sparsely populated rural community, whereas uh, Judea and Samaria has over 500 kilometers of border, which abuts a heavily populated urban community, and so anything that 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 you saw in 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 Gaza will just be a picnic compared to what you can you, you you'd have in Judea and Samaria. And uh, Judea and Samaria is the highlands. Gaza Gaza is topographically doesn't uh, control any any area because it doesn't have the height. But Judea and Samaria, the hills tower above the coastal plain, which houses about eighty uh, percent of the population, eighty percent of the economic activity, uh, much of the critical infrastructure of Israel. The, the only international airport, uh, and, and it's uh, civilian and, and naval ports. So, you know, if, if, you, if you don't want Netanyahu, uh, a, a holiday town on, on between Tel Aviv and Haifa, to become the Shderot, of, of, of Shderot by the sea, uh, you, you can't give it up. It's impossible to give it up. Dr. Sherman, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for a viewing audience? Well, I think that you can summarize the political situation in Gaza in an almost mathematical algorithm. The only way that Israel can determine who rules Gaza and how Gaza is ruled is for Israel to rule it itself. Thank you, Dr. Shermer, for being on our show, and thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. And now, the truth from Zion. A disturbing trend has emerged around the globe, creating a serious safety threat to individuals. This threat manifests itself in growing support and admiration for one of the world's deadliest terror groups. Radical support for Hamas, combined with the sharpest rise of anti-Semitism in recent history, is leading to attacks on Jewish people in Israel and beyond. Most surprising is the fact that many of those promoting this bigotry are academics. Jewish students say they feel unsafe at school. Many are afraid to show outward signs that they are Jewish. Countless students reported that they have been stalked on campus. Mezuzahs have been ripped off their doors. Jewish students have been humiliated and harassed on social media and even forced out of social and academic clubs on campus for simply being Jewish or being a supporter of Israel. Another unsettling reality is that adults who should be working to keep learning environments safe and tolerant are actually showing a lack of resolve and leadership. The United States Congress is working to identify and deal with issues of hate speech on campuses as demonstrations in support of Palestinians include a growing chorus urging the elimination of Israel and the Jewish people. University campuses around the world have turned into a hotbed of anti-Semitism. It is shocking to hear students chant that to the Jews with impunity, while the Jewish students remain completely isolated. Prestigious university presidents insist there is nothing they can do to stop these threatening words. These leaders of academia suggest they are waiting for Jewish students to get hurt or killed before responding to the threats. Jewish students find themselves in environments where, more often than not, anti-Semitic rhetoric goes unchallenged. The impact on these students is not only psychological, 
but also raises questions about the commitment to fostering an inclusive and tolerant educational space. Some professors have even abandoned their classrooms to join the protesters, even standing outside the Israeli embassy while chanting these threatening slogans. Marchers shouting, globalize the Intifada, are advocating for a worldwide movement to violently rise up against Jews and Christians. In London, half a million people took to the streets, garnering international attention and widespread media coverage. That was just one of numerous hate-filled processions. In late November, protests erupted in all the major cities in Spain. Spanish labor unions demanded a ceasefire and for Israel to be tried at the International Criminal Court at The Hague. Signs read no to the partition of Palestine, implying that Israel should cease to exist. And in Australia, the land down under, that happens to be 7,590 miles away from the conflict, anti-Israel demonstrations popped up in Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. There, just as in other cities around the world, extremists shouted their support for the Hamas terrorist organization. Students have walked out of classrooms. People are rallying and the tens of thousands as a mainstream media often describe Israel as being an occupying force in Gaza, ignoring the fact that Israel removed every last shred of Israeli presence from Gaza in 2005. At the time, Israeli politicians believed this delusional disengagement plan would bring peace. It did not. These marches should be of grave concern to anyone who values freedom and democracy. Not only are people around the world supporting Hamas, but this war has also unmasked some people's radical ideologies. Even in New York City, speakers at a Times Square rally outwardly suggested everyone should take up the religion of Islam. They literally said, it will be in every home. The only God to worship is Allah. While New York City historically has been viewed as a beacon of tolerance and coexistence and the biggest melting pot on the planet, every day New Yorkers were seen ripping down posters of hostages. Some even denied that hostages were taken on October 7th. As these reports gain attention, questions are arising about how universities and cities will address and combat Jew hatred and rising anti-Semitism especially in light of the fact that any disparaging comments or threats about any other minority would not be tolerated. Many in the international community are responding to this challenge, while others are looking to amplify it for their own ideological purposes. As the world grapples with this unsettling trend, the need for a collective effort to counteract hate and prejudice becomes more apparent than ever. Up next, the ICEJ report from the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. Psalm 91 says that he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High abides in the shadow of the Almighty. Now for the Jewish people, this very beautiful promise and powerful promise has a whole different meaning. If you are down in the envelope around the Gaza Strip, you will find a network of hundreds, if not thousands, of bomb shelters that are all over the place, and they have one single purpose, and that is to save lives. Just over this last couple of weeks, there were more than 12,000 missiles that came over from the Gaza Strip, attacking uh, those communities in the Gaza envelope. Since the last 10 years, the International Christian Embassy have been actively engaged to build more than 200 bomb shelters in this area, area to provide the necessary safety for the people of Israel. Please have a look.
just around the corner, a few meters, a few uh, feet away from here, is a young group of young kids that are practicing and rehearsing in their sports class. And this bomb shelter will serve from them. That means if there is a alarm here in the region, they just can run out of the house and they have a safe bomb shelter here. My name is Ivo Panchev. I'm sensei in this dojo. I'm happy to hear that Christians have an organization that uh, donate the money and shuttles for, for, this, uh, for our area. I hope that will be shalom and uh, peace. Uh, I think it will be. Okay. If everyone wants this so strong, it will be. When the bomb threat was becoming more and more severe, and they, the first place that was protected against bombs were, were, were the kindergartens. We can't wait until, until we hear a code red or see something that's about to, you know, on fire. We have to know what to do, we spend a lot of time preparing. And we practice with the children. They know that if there's a code red when they're on a walk, not near a building, then they cover their heads. They know to do it. For if I'm caught between one place and the other and there's a shelter there and I can go in, then practically it's very important. My name is Sagida Kalchan, uh, and four years ago I was the founder, one of the founders, to open this, this uh, music school. And now we have 42 kids. Being here is something very brave. Maybe they don't necessarily understand how brave it is to be four kilometers from the Gaza border, but their parents do. These, these bomb shelters are the only reason we can have this boarding school here. We can't be here without them. I well remember how I was speaking at a conference in Europe and uh, an Israeli number called me. Uh, the person asked, do I talk to Jürgen Bühler? And I said, yes, of course you do. And the person introduced himself as Shai Hermesh. He was back then a member of Knesset in Israel. And he said, Jürgen, you just saved my life. And I asked him, how is that possible? I'm right now speaking on a Bible school in Europe it's impossible for me to save your life. He says, no, I'm living in Kfar Asa. And we just had the red alert. I had short time to run to the bomb shelter. And this bomb shelter took a direct hit from one of the missiles. And I saw a big sign inside, donated by the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. He said, Jürgen, this bomb shelter saved my life. And I want to ask you today, as you heard those many stories, how lives have been saved, how this is a game changer for many in Israel to help us in these critical times to keep building those life-saving bomb shelters. It makes a huge difference for Israelis in schools, in kindergartens, or even outside of supermarkets to know that there is a safe place they can run immediately to it. Your donation will save lives in Israel. Thank you so much for standing with us in these critical times. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.